Well, good morning, Redeemer Church. Uh, my name is TJ Smith, if we haven't met before, and um, I'm grateful for my brother elders and some of their kind words, and um, we appreciate your prayers, even during this kind of time of transition as a church. Um, I, I'm just grateful um, for my family as well as we um, just walk with you all during this time. We're just grateful to the Lord Jesus Christ for his um, leadership of our church. He is the chief shepherd, and we follow him, and we know him, and we love him. And so it is a great joy even to be with you um, this morning. I think um, the, in the last couple of weeks, we've gotten to visit with a number of community groups, and it's just been a, a joy to, to hear some of your questions, hear some of your stories. I'm going to ask you guys questions, and uh, so I don't know if you're involved in a community group, but it really is such a great place to be known and to know other people. And uh, it's a, a great time for my wife and I visiting with a number of those groups. Um, well, this morning we're going to be looking at 2 Peter chapter 1, because this passage, verses 1 to 11, really is a summary of the Christian life. It captures what it means to be a Christian, what it means to flourish as a follower or disciple of Jesus. Uh, we see here God's grace in salvation. We'll see here God's grace in our holiness as we grow in Christ. Um, Redeemer Church, the abundant Christian life begins and ends with grace. His grace saves us and secures us and sanctifies us and fuels our holiness and gives us joy and gives us assurance for the life to come. And so we begin and end everything with the extraordinary grace of God. Now I'm going to read the passage here in just a minute and then pray. And so um, follow along with me in your personal copy of God's Word. In 2 Peter chapter 1, it says, Simeon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence, by which He has granted to us His precious and very great promises, so that through them, You may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. Father in heaven, I pray that you would help us to see your glory and the glory of your Son in this passage, that you would encourage us, great God, by the promises you've given us, by the great grace that you've shown us in and through Jesus Christ. In whose name I pray, amen. Well, this passage bursts with grace, and we're going to see that in in three different ways. We'll see the stunning scope of God's grace and the source of God's grace, and then the transforming result of God's grace. And so let's dive in. Look in verse 3, because we'll pick up there with the scope of God's grace. His divine power, it says there, has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. That is to say, God has given you and me Everything that we need, everything that pertains to or that is necessary to live a godly life has been granted. It's been given to us. Whatever it means to live the abundant Christian life has been already bestowed or given to the Christian. This is like a gift, a present that's got your name written on it. And it's been given to you. And you can open it up. It's already been bestowed. This grace that God has given is for our good, for our joy, for our strength. And anything, everything that we need to live a faithful Christian life is what Peter talks about here. This gift, this life in godliness is not just for the, the, the hereafter, after we die and go to heaven, but, but even right now, today, this week, this month, That which God expects of us, desires from us, He has given us the strength by His divine power to live this life of godliness. Everything, friends. And so fathers, brothers, everything that it means for us to lead our families well, God has given to us. Uh, Sisters, everything that it means to, to live a life adorned with good works. God has already given you that which you need or require to please Him. And yet, let's dive in a little, uh, get a little more detailed here because it's good to see all of the promises that God has gifted us. Uh, if you look just a little bit later in 2 Peter chapter 1, we see about the Word of God. Verse 18 or 19 reads, And we have the prophetic word 
more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Verse 21 reads, For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of God or by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Friends, God has gifted up Scripture. This book from which I'm reading right now is the very breath of God. God has spoken, and, and we would do well to pay attention to it. For as Peter wrote, it is, it is shining in a dark place. Oh, there are so many Christians who live in turmoil, and they're churning, and, they, and they're confused, and they don't know what to do for their life and their godliness. And, and right here, God has given us a sufficient word, His authoritative revelation by which we can know Him and love Him. Friends, God has given us His word for our life and for our godliness. And yet there's more, you know. The Holy Spirit has been given to us. Peter spoke about Him there, that the Holy Spirit is the one that moved men to write Scripture. In, in Ephesians chapter 1, this same Holy Spirit is the one that seals every Christian, that strengthens every Christian to live a holy life. God has gifted us, given us everything that we need for life and godliness in His Word and by His Spirit. But you know, there's more. There's even more to this gift of grace that God has granted us. He's given us faith. You know, in the, up in verse 1, we read about a faith that we have obtained, that we've been given. Faith is a gift, friends. And God has given us that we might trust Him and know Him. In the same verse, verse 1, it says that we have received or experienced the righteousness of Jesus Christ. The righteousness of, of Jesus. It's not our righteousness. It's a gift. And so we have the righteousness of Jesus and the faith that God gives us and the Holy Spirit and the Holy Scriptures all so that we might live a godly, faithful, abundant Christian life. These good gifts are given, friends, so that we might know Him and love Him. And there's so much more, right? We could look in 1 Peter at the hope that He's given us through the resurrection of Jesus or the joy that He's given us that we will experience fully when we see Him face to face. God has given me and you, everything that we need to live a life that is pleasing to Him. In this passage, we see one other aspect of this great gift. Because in verse 4, you know, in verse 3, we read, His divine power is granted to us all things. In verse 4, we read, He has granted to us. His precious and very great promises. His precious and very great promises. Oh, friends, by His glory and by His excellence, He has given us pledges, declarations. If you're a believer, a follower of Christ, God has promised to you to be for you all that you need in this life. But I want you to see some of these things because the, these, these promises, they are precious. They are very great. I just want you to see three or four. You know, Romans chapter 10, verse 11, the Apostle Paul writes, Those who trust in the Lord will never be ashamed. Those who have turned to and trusted upon the Lord Jesus Christ, they will have no cause for shame. He's actually quoting Psalm chapter 25. And this promise is for me and it's for you that if we trust our Lord Jesus Christ, we will have no cause for shame. What an amazing promise. Or I'm, I remember that God declares Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. In the context of Hebrews 13, it's about contentment. He says, be content. And then God says, for I'll never leave you or forsake you. Christian, you and I can be content because God has promised to us never to leave us or forsake us. Or we, we see further in, in 1 Peter chapter 5, God says, Cast all of your cares, all of your anxieties on the Lord, for He cares for you. Or 1 John, the Apostle John writes, If we confess our sins, He is, here's the promise, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is where you and I live every single day, Christian. We live every day under the, the faithfulness and justice of God who forgives us of our sin and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. These promises are precious. 
And there are so many more, so many more. I've given you four here, right? There are 40, 40,000 where God has promised to us to be for us all that we need to live a godly life. They're for our good, to feed our faith. They are a feast for our soul. Some weeks, though, some weeks, I know these promises, but some weeks I struggle. I have a, like a, a fog that descends on my brain. I can't remember sometimes these promises. And I know that sometimes you struggle to remember these promises. Isn't it amazing that God has given us his word so that we can read them and study them and memorize them? And, and I need this book and you need this book. I'm so thankful that God has given me other Christians like you who can remind me when I have that that fog and I can't seem to remember who will never leave me or forsake me or what do I do when I have sinned. You remind me and I can remind you of such promises that we see in his word. For these promises are given for our good. We'll see later they're given so that we might become partakers of the divine nature, escape the corruption that is in this world because of sinful desire. So I wonder, how are you doing in trusting the promises of God? How are you doing trusting the God of all promise? Because God has given to you these precious and very great promises for your good so that you might live a life that is pleasing to Him. Did you notice? Did you notice in the passage? It doesn't say that you've given, been given everything that you want for life and godliness, right? It doesn't say that you've been given everything that you think that you need for life and godliness. Some people think they need a new vehicle or a bigger villa or a better life or a new wife. I don't know what you think you need, but God knows what you need to live a godly life, one that is pleasing to Him. And so He has given you, gifted you everything that you need for for this abundant life. And And that doesn't include financial prosperity or a new job necessarily or physical health or physical stability because God hasn't promised all Christians this. In fact, in the letter that Peter writes to these same Christians in 1 Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 4, Peter writes to them and and said, do not be surprised by the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Peter wrote these same Christians and said, you will often encounter persecution or suffering or hardship. That's normal Christianity. And then he writes these same Christians and says, you have everything that you need to live a godly spiritual life, even in in the midst of that storm. In this book, 2 Peter, the entirety of chapter 2 is devoted to a coming storm of false teachers. False teachers, they bring destruction, immorality, And Peter wants to ground the church in the extraordinary grace of God to prepare them for that coming storm, to to prepare them so they can fend off that hardship that's going to come that he talks about in chapter 2. And so if you're a follower of Christ, friend, God has resourced or given you everything that you need for your godliness to please Him, His Word and His Spirit and His righteousness and faith and joy and hope and peace and life with God. Grace, my friends, for suffering. Grace when we encounter pain. Grace when people are against us. Grace when we are confused. He's given us so much. And I want you to see in this passage how you and I experience this grace I want you to see how, a, how an individual or a church comes to enter into this because we see in this passage the intimate source of God's extraordinary grace. Verse 3, the very next phrase says that it is through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence. <laughs> brothers, and Christi- brothers and sisters, God has called us to Himself right, so that we can know Him so we can experience life with Him. And it is through knowing this God, through trusting Him, embracing Him as, as His own, that, that we experience life with God. And now, you and I, you and I, as we see in this passage, we experience something that is actually astounding. It, it, it's actually shocking. It's surprising because you and I, as Christians, we can know God. 
I mean, just imagine, we're creatures. We are finite. We barely know what's going to happen later this afternoon. And we as creatures, we see in this passage, we have come to know our Creator. And we know Him truly, if not comprehensively. We know Him from our heart. And it is through this knowledge of the eternal God that you and I begin to experience this great bounty, this gift of grace. And so let's talk about this great knowledge of God because the, the, the dilemma of the world, I mean, the great problem of the world is that the world does not know God, not naturally. Humanity is separated from God. Naturally, human beings are, are spiritually blind, spiritually ignorant. Uh, humanly speaking, People do not know God. They're they're separated from Him. The book of Romans chapter 1 talks about this knowledge of God and the way that people think about God. In Romans chapter 1, Paul describes for us what is the spiritual condition of everybody born in the United States of America, where I was born, or in the United Arab Emirates, where we live today. It's in, in Romans chapter 1 and verse 18, we see what is the spiritual condition of every single Nigerian and Filipino and American and Indian. We see it here spelled out. Verse 18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. Verse 20 says, For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they, so they, who? So they, all of humanity, all of the world is without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give him thanks but they became futile, empty, vain in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Friends, our hearts were darkened. Our thinking was futile, was empty, worthless. We did not know God until God called us to Himself. God saw us He set His love on us. He drew us to Himself. And we can say today, Christian, you and I know God. We know the Creator. We know Him personally. In Christianity, friends, Christian, knowing God is a very great thing. It's an astounding thing. All through Scripture, to know someone is is an important thing, a deep thing. You remember Adam and Eve? It says there in Genesis chapter 4, verse 1, that Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bore a son. To to know someone in the book of Genesis was to be so intimate with them, to know them truly, personally. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 1, verse 3, we see this negatively. You know, the Lord speaks of Israel, children have I reared and brought up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its master. The donkey knows its master's crib, but Israel does not know. Israel does not understand. There, the nation of Israel is seen as rebellious to. Though they know about God, they don't know Him, not personally. Friends, you and I, we were lost, separated from God, and that is why Jesus Christ came, so that we could know God. Do you guys remember John chapter 14, 6? One of those amazing I am statements. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth. You you get to know it. Say it with me. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The very next verse, verse 7, Jesus says, If you know me, you will also know my Father. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. That is to say, Jesus says, to know the Father is to know me. When you've seen me, you've seen the Father. In John chapter 17, verse 3, Jesus says, and this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you've sent. 
Friends, you and I were meant to know God. The theologian J.I. Packer rightly asked, what were we made for to know God? What aim should we set ourselves in life to know God? What is the eternal life that Jesus gives? The knowledge of God. What is the best thing in life bringing more joy, delight, and contentment than anything else? The knowledge of God. This knowledge of God is, is so important. We see it here in, in 2 Peter chapter 1. In verse 2, Peter begins his letter with this blessing. These, these aren't just empty words. This is what he desires for every single church, for every single Christian. He says, may grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge or knowing God and of Jesus our Lord. He, he concludes his letter with similar words in, in 2 Peter chapter 3. He says, verse 18, but grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. This is a personal, true, intimate knowledge of God that you and I can have. One scholar surveyed this word throughout the New Testament period of time, and he, he summarized this word for knowledge this way. He said it means to come to know someone for who they really are. Coming to know someone for who they really are. You know, when you know somebody really, truly, intimately, deeply, you can almost read their mind. Right? It's almost like a superpower. You know, your, your best friend, you don't have to ask them what's their, what's their favorite food. You know what their favorite food is. If you ask me what my wife is thinking on, on any given day, sometimes I actually know it because we know each other. Coming to know someone who they really are, this kind of intimate knowledge. Friends, you and I know God. If you're a Christian, if you're a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, you have come into relationship with Him by His grace, and you and I can say, not comprehensively, but truly, we know the God of the universe. What a great thing it is to be in fellowship with this great God. Now, friends, Redeemer Church, there, there are two errors that Christians sometimes slide into when, when we talk about this knowledge of God. Two ways we get confused, right? The first error is that Christians sometimes confuse knowledge about God with knowing God personally. You know, it's like this, this true knowledge of God is not merely or mentally facts, right? We, we sometimes confuse the extraordinary grace of God in knowing Him personally with knowing about God, knowing facts about God. And so sometimes people get puffed up by what they think they know. You know there's, a, there's a second error, and that is some people, uh, some people, they know that the knowledge of God is not merely facts, and so then they disregard or ignore the Word of God. They ignore learning. They kind of disregard or disdain learning and thinking about God. So they rightly understand that the knowledge of God, knowing God, is more than mere facts, but then they become puffed up by what they don't know. Oh, friends, to know this great God and Savior is to feast on Him, and so the more we know about Him, the more we're going to love Him. And so think deeply about His glory and His excellence. Learn His precious and very great promises. Become acquainted with Him because the more that you know Him and know about Him, the more you're going to love Him. Huh. To, to have a true faith, an abiding faith, a love for this God will never be less than facts, though it may be more. And so let us hunger for a deeper knowledge of this great God and Savior as we see Him in Scripture because knowing God is extraordinary. It's the way that we experience God's grace. Now, I want to ask a question because, friends, if formerly, if formerly we were lost and blind and ignorant and we didn't know God, and now we know God and we experience this life with Him, how did that happen? How at one point... At one point, we didn't know Him. Now we do know Him. How, what changed or what transpired that you and I, as followers of Jesus, can say, we know the Creator? 
You know, it's not, it's not based on your family ancestry, right? It's not based on your name or your skin color or the culture in which you were born. It's not based on your performance, whether you come to a church or whether you dress a certain way or eat this food or don't eat that food. It's not based on anything that is in us. How then have we come to know this great God? Well, we see the answer here in verse 1. In verse 1, Peter writes, To those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He says there, those who have a faith of equal standing with ours on the basis or by the righteousness of our God, Jesus Christ. These are the people that have come to know God. So if you have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have come to know God, and your faith is on equal standing with that of the Apostle Peter. Now think about that. Peter was called by the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter followed the Lord Jesus Christ, and for three and a half years, he saw Jesus Christ perform countless miracles and and, and exorcisms, and and Peter himself later performed miracles and demonic exorcism. And this Peter saw Jesus Christ arrested and, and falsely accused and beaten and scourged and then nailed to a cross. He saw Jesus Christ die. He saw where Jesus Christ was buried. This Peter saw that Jesus Christ rose from the dead and he heard the commission that that Jesus Christ gave to him. And then Peter, for the rest of his life, preached that salvation is in no other name than this one, Jesus Christ. Ultimately, Peter, according to church history, Peter was murdered. He was crucified upside down because he was convinced that Jesus Christ was the way, the truth, and the life. And Peter's faith, Peter's faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ are of the same quality, the same kind of an equal standing. So it's not a, there's not like a superior faith and an inferior faith. There's a superior Savior who saves us and draws us and we trust in Him. And so we see here that those who have obtained a faith of equal standing experience this grace. We also see that it is by the righteousness of Jesus. It is by the righteousness of Jesus that we experience this kind of knowledge, which is to say, not our righteousness. It is not your righteousness that brings you in a relationship with God. It is the righteousness of another, of Jesus Christ. So that when He died on the cross for us, when He rose from the dead, anyone who trusts in Him receives his righteousness. And so on the basis of our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we experience his righteousness. We come to know this great God and Savior. And we know him truly through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We know him because of his glory and his goodness. We've turned to him. We've trusted him. And now we live with God. We actually see that as the transforming effect of this grace, that we now have life with God, having escaped the corruption that is in the world. We see this transforming result in the next verse, verse 4, because it says there, He has granted to us His precious and very great promises, so that through them, through those promises, through all that God has given us, we might experience two things, two things simultaneously, really. We, we become partakers of the divine nature, what we're saved to. We escape the corruption that is in the world, what we're saved from. Let's look at that, that two-way transformation, what we're saved to and what we're saved from. Pa- Peter calls it here that we become partakers of the divine nature. We begin to participate in or to share in God's own character. His holiness becomes our holiness. His life becomes our life. What God loves, we love. His goodness becomes our goodness. We begin to actually reflect and take on the very character of God in our lives as we come to know Him. And so, Christian, you and I are right now sharing in the life of God, which is to say, after we die and we enter into the new heavens and the new earth, we will see God as He is, right? We will experience life with with God as He is. But it's not just then. It starts now. 
today, if you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are experiencing life with the eternal God today. You fellowship with Him. You share in His life. It's one of the most astounding things that we can say, one of the most marvelous, mysterious phrases in all of Scripture, that we become partakers of God's own nature, of God's own life. It reminds me of what Paul wrote in, in Romans chapter 8, that we would be conformed to the image of His Son, or, or even 1 John chapter 3. The Apostle John says, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet been revealed. Or appear, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we will see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. What John is saying is, is we will one day see him as he is and we will be transformed. And yet even now, as we, as we await that, as we hope in that, we are purifying ourselves now as he himself is pure. And so this life of God is something we experience today through the knowledge of Him who called us by His glory and His excellence. To become a partaker partaker of the divine nature is to have fellowship with God this afternoon. When you speak with your loved ones about the things that you've heard today, or when you talk with your neighbors about what it means to know the Lord Jesus Christ, or when you go to work this week and you're a faithful Christian living a life of holiness. You're becoming a partaker of the divine nature through the grace of God, through the knowledge of God, through obedience to what God has called us to do. This is what we're saved to, to know Him, to become like Him, to live life with Him. We see what we're saved to. Let's also see what we're saved from. Because we see that we, in this passage, we escape the corruption that is in this world. You know, the the sinful passions or or desires of the world would corrupt us. But we, as, as, as followers of Christ, we are free from the enslavements of the world. We've been delivered from the domain of darkness. We've been delivered to the kingdom of His beloved Son. We've been liberated from the lusts of this world. The woes of this world no longer hold us down or, or, or keep us in bondage. We have, Christian, an increasing distaste for the things of this world. As Peter says, for the rest of our lives, we no longer live for human passions or desires, but for the will of God. For there has already been enough time spent doing what non-Christians choose to do, living in sensuality and passions and drunkenness and orgies and drinking parties and lawless idolatry. That's not me. That's Peter in 1 Peter chapter 4. He says, on account of these things, the God is coming to judge the living and the dead. Christian, you, you and I, it is good to refrain from the indulgences of this world. Because the grace of God has already appeared, teaching us, training us to deny ungodliness, to say no to ungodliness and worldly desires. And so Christians, you and I, we turn from the the ongoing corruption of the world, and as we do so, we become partakers of this divine life, partakers of the divine nature. They they happen together. You you can't have the life of God with you and be living and, and of the life of immorality. God desires that we would take on life with Him through faith. Now, one of Peter's main concerns in this letter is that some Christians don't actually live like this. Some Christians don't actually live like they've escaped the corruption that is living in the world because of evil desires. Some teachers out there, some online, some here in Dubai, they, they teach that Christians can live however they want. They can do whatever they want, sleep with whomever they want, drink whatever they want, and, and you're all good because of the, the purported grace of God. Peter, the apostle, calls these people false teachers. They teach falsely. And I know that even some of you, perhaps, have been confused or deceived by such a thing. Some of you think that you can be a follower of Christ and live however you want. Peter says it ought not to be. Brothers and sisters... We are no longer enslaved to the things of the world. We have been freed from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. We ought not to go back to those things that once enslaved us. Some of you know what I'm talking about. 
Some of you know because you are overcome with sin. You feel in bondage to something. I just encourage you today. I invite you today. Come into the light. Come and speak with any one of the elders of the pastors here. Speak with a, a CG leader. In fact, talk to any other member here. Ask them to pray for you, and they'll pray for you. Ask them to help you work through to be free from the enslavements of this corrupted world because that is God's desire for people who follow the Lord Jesus Christ that we would flee, escape from, leave the corruptions of this world so that we might know the glory and the excellence of our God and become like Him, live life with Him. You know, this escape we read about in verse 4 regards a moral escape, the moral corruptions that are in this world. Uh, but there's coming a judgment upon all corruption. And Christians, we, we don't experience this coming judgment, right? Because in 2 Peter chapter 3, it talks about this, this day of judgment that is coming for all people, that God is going to come and He's going to judge the living and the dead, and every single human being will be before God on that day. Chapter 3, verse 7, he talks about the, the judgment of the ungodly. He says that the day of the Lord is coming like a thief. That means we won't expect it. And yet, Christian, you and I have no fear of that day because we have been forgiven. We have been pardoned through the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so you and I, follower of Christ, have nothing to fear on that day of judgment. Now, if you're not a Christian, if you're not a follower or disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, today is that day to turn to and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ because the promise is for you as well. Those who trust in Him will never be ashamed. And should you turn and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, then by faith, because of what He's done, His righteousness becomes your righteousness. And you will have nothing to fear on that day of judgment that comes. This, my friends, is the extraordinary grace of God in salvation. That we have done nothing to earn, nothing to merit. We, we pay nothing. Because God has already done it for us. We experience life with God. We know God and we're becoming like Him every day as we escape the corruptions that are in this world because of sinful desire. Let us now pray and thank this great God for His salvation. Father, I thank You so much for Your grace to us. For even as we sang earlier, <laughs> Jesus is our gift of grace. There's no more You could give. He is my righteousness. He is my joy he is my peace. Oh God, I'm thankful for all of the, the grace and the strength that you give us as your people. Though we sin, yet you are faithful to us. Though we forget your promises, you remain faithful. Oh Father in heaven, help us to see Jesus Christ because we want to know him. We want to know you and we do know you. Oh, great God, I thank you so much for your grace that we as creatures can know you and love you and be in, in relationship with you. Oh, great God, I ask that even now you would open the eyes of those who have yet to see that they might trust in your Son, Jesus Christ. In whose name I pray, amen.